and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz-Cohen, speaking to you from my office as Dean of the Pannoni Honors College at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today my guest is William Horberg, a notable and highly versatile film producer. The range of his production credits include such films as The Talented Mr. Ripley, The Quiet American, Cold Mountain, both versions of Death at a Funeral, Lars and the Real Girl, The Kite Runner, Milk, and Adventureland, and many others that have won or were nominated for Academy Awards and other honors. William Horberg, welcome to the Drexel interview. Hi, Paula. Thanks <laughs> for having me. Well, it is a great pleasure, and you are a producer of, of real note, and I want to get into what that means, being a producer. But we'll wait with that. I first want to know about how you got into movies, whether you were somebody who loved movies from an early age. Was there was this a first love? No, my first love was really music. Uh, I set out and played music in high school and was in a band and I uh, went to school, uh, went to music school in Boston. Uh, and at that time in the 70s there was kind of a raging scene of movie theaters. You could only watch movies really on TV or in the theaters, and the people that I lived with at that time were running the film society mm -hmm. at their college. So there was a lot of like 16 millimeter prints come in every weekend and programming discussions. And I remember that time. Everybody <laughs> was reading Andrew Saris's <laughs> American Cinema. Uh, and so I was kind of uh, toe dipping in that world while I was pursuing music. And uh, ultimately I moved back to Chicago and kind of stumbled on this entrepreneurial idea of opening a movie theater uh, myself with a friend from Chicago that I had gone to school with. And so that was really like this door that opened to me and an opportunity that presented itself. And uh, suddenly at 19, uh, I found myself a kind of young uh, business owner and film programmer and popcorn maker and you know, uh, ticket interesting, seller. You know what's interesting about that? It was a revival house, right? And when you think about the early moguls and the early entrepreneurs and they owned movie houses and worked in distribution and then they went into production which you sort of did but you don't hear about that as much nowadays. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. a Nickelodeon of course no. <laughs> but uh, uh, it is interesting to have come to it through exhibition. You know it's kind of the last stop on the the train in terms of that's where film meets audience and to you know program films and sit with audiences every night and experience them and that uh, kind of way and, and do, you, do you think you learned about audience taste as well as I guess film history through this process? Yeah, I, I felt it was a real undergraduate education for me in several ways, you know, just in uh, business and management and having uh, uh, employees and staff and then, you know, uh, programming and writing about film and uh, and then, as you say, also just uh, experiencing film with audiences and what's popular and what's not. And Getting into producing, uh, how did you make that transition? Well, I really was a kid who printed business cards that said producer on it. So you wanted Having, to be a, you realized you wanted to be a producer. At that time, yeah. The theater closed down and I was kind of back on the streets and... Uh, you know, having to hustle and figure it out to survive. And uh, I, I was writing some scripts uh, in a kind of self-taught way. Uh, I actually sought out and optioned a couple of books that I uh, got the rights to and was trying to, you know, uh, in a kind of formative way, figure out how to put together and see if I could get made. And uh, I knew some people from the Board of Trade in Chicago who were commodity brokers who <laughs> were a bit gamblers by their nature and uh, I was able to raise some money for various projects and um, and then the thing that really launched me in a way was uh, through a relationship I had uh, with the mayor's office of the city I was able to get a contract to uh, tape some of the live music performances at the outdoor summer music festival that they promoted called Chicago Fest 
And we ended up with the public television station in Chicago and the newly formed MTV, who uh, the executives were some guys from Chicago. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that was wonderful for me was we filmed a whole week of the blues stage there. And, you know, Chicago's kind of famous for its uh, legacy and blues history. And uh, Muddy Waters' last live film performance was at this wow. festival, and we captured that and uh, were able to kind of sell that to a number of television stations around the country, uh, the kind of emerging cable subscription TV uh, networks that were just kind of the Wild West back then. So sure. there was a bit of an op opportunity for someone like me who wasn't from the corporate world and didn't have a, a, a resume. Uh, but, you know, I had the content. I had this programming. I was able to go around it's, and Yeah, it's interesting how you had the music, then you had the entrepreneurial aspect yeah. through the theater, and then you were able to combine them and become a producer of music, video, film. Yeah, yeah. And then move on, I guess, into fiction film. Yeah, I, I stayed in Chicago for a number of years and uh, kind of resisted the siren call Was there of a siren Hollywood call? and Los Angeles. <laughs> well, uh, some part of me knew that if I seriously wanted to pursue that, that I was a, a bit of a lone wolf in Chicago and, uh, you know, I needed to get where the business really was. But uh, I, I was developing film projects uh, independently from Chicago mm -hmm. and uh, in a, a kind of amazingly serendipitous way two of the three of them actually uh, ultimately got made. Uh, one was a book I optioned called Miami Blues mm -hmm. by a writer named Charles Williford who was kind of an Elmore Leonard type mm -hmm. American original crime writer uh, that got made ultimately as a movie that uh, Fred Ward and Alec Baldwin and Jennifer mm -hmm. Jason Lee starred in for Orion. Uh, and then there was another book uh, by a wonderful black writer named Chester Himes, who was a kind of a expat. He lived in Paris and wrote I've heard the name. crime fiction. Yeah. Uh, his, his movie, Cotton Comes to Harlem, had yeah. been made in the 70s and was kind of in that era of black exploitation cinema. And we uh, optioned another one of his books called The Rage in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the very early movies that Harvey Weinstein made uh, at the beginning of uh, Miramax. And uh, Danny Glover and Forrest Whitaker and Gregory Hines. And these were early productions of yours, so which were with big stars. I guess they weren't quite as big then as they are now. So yeah. I certainly um, get you got in at the ground floor. Yeah. I mean, there were both things that I generated and initiated and ultimately had to find more experienced partners to help me, you know, put them together and, and get them made. and. Uh, by the time they were shot, I had actually relocated to Los Angeles. I, I moved out there in 86, uh, and I uh, got a job as a kind of junior level studio executive at Paramount. What was it like being at Paramount working on this array of films? And I mean, what were the pros and cons of that job? Well, the first year was a bit like a college fraternity hazing program. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'd never worked in a big corporation before, uh, and I, you know, uh, had a tremendous amount of uh, work thrown on my desk. Here's three scripts, read them by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, and, you know, uh, 15 scripts on the weekend. Uh, so, but it was, it was amazing, you know. It was like, here's Mike Nichols, and here's Francis Ford Coppola, and here's Harrison Ford, and... Uh, that's where I met Sidney Pollack, who ultimately became an incredibly important person in my life. And, you know, uh, Simpson and Bruckheimer were there, and it was the heyday of John Hughes and Eddie Murphy. And, uh, you know, I, I had never watched dailies on a movie before. I hadn't really been on the set of a major feature film, you know, shooting at that point. So uh, I was just like a kid in a candy store. Um, you know, there are aspects of working in a studio that are slightly surreal and it can be very competitive and territorial and certainly you know high pressure high stakes uh, every decision you know carries with it a, a lot of cost um, you don't strike me though as somebody who's driven although of course it's, it can be very deceptive but you certainly don't struck me strike me as a cutthroat 
um, you know, one of these soulless Hollywood producers. How did, how did you manage in that environment? Well, soulless Hollywood producer can be a bit of a cliche. And Is like it a all cliche? Cliches, I've heard it from actually people who were there. Yeah, there's uh, truth in cliches. Yeah. That's how they become cliches. Yeah. And there certainly are, you know, uh, it's a place where the psychopathic personality, <laughs> you know, can tend to succeed, you know. Uh, I mean, it rewards... Why is it that, rewards, that it will tend to succeed? Well, it rewards aggression, you know, certainly. And it rewards a certain level of insensitivity or, you know, if you take on in an empathic way all of the, you know, issues that other people have, you, you know, you kind of compromise the singularity of purpose that you might need. Uh, you know, it's very, very hard to wrangle all the elements that you need to get any one of these projects made and through the, the system. And it's designed to be hard, you know, mm -hmm. you try to make sure that only uh, you know, the most committed and persevered, uh, you know, get there. Um, so but for I, yourself, I, operating within that milieu, you, did you, were you aware of a balance between compassion and hard-driving aggression? Yeah, I, I loved storytelling, you know, and that was kind of my passion. And then as a studio executive, you know, working in an almost editorial way with writers and filmmakers and just trying to help them solve the equations of their script. And I think people saw me as, you know, sincere in that and I, I didn't have any kind of hidden agendas in terms of how I was presenting myself and dealing with people. And, you know, there was a, a part of it where you felt like you had to put on the suit of armor every day when you went to work and, mm -hmm. you know, wear that uh, and the weight of that, you know. And so I, I was there for almost five years. Paramount. And, um, you know, probably had an opportunity to stay within the executive ranks and become a president there or, you know, go as far as it would take me. Uh, but uh, ultimately, you know, as I, you know, wonderfully took on more and more responsibility, I think the last year I was there, I, I had seven films in production and post-production and, mm -hmm. you know, on the way to release. And as I said, you know, I got to be in Italy with Francis Ford Coppola when he was making The Godfather and be with Mike Nichols around the making of Regarding Henry and Kenneth Branagh and Emma Thompson came and made this little script we had called Dead Again. And uh, I have to mention there was a senior executive at Paramount who's been a lifelong friend and just a wonderful mentor and model for me, role model, a woman named Lindsay Duran, mm -hmm. who went on to be the president of United Artists and she was Sidney Pollack's partner before I was and she's been the producer of Sense and Sensibility and the Nanny McPhee movies. And uh, so she was somebody that I really gravitated towards and ended up as a junior colleague on many of her projects and then when she left, I inherited a number of those relationships, and uh, and then I ultimately ended up following, following her. her. She was a mentor of sorts then. She really yeah. was, yeah. And then you went, then you went to Mirage Enterprises and worked with the great Sidney Pollock. I'm fascinated by that. I mean, this is where you did Searching for Bobby Fisher, The Talented Mr. Ripley, The Quiet American. I love that film, and Cold Mountain, among yeah. others. Um, what was the difference then in moving from Paramount to Mirage and working with Pollock? Well, there's a fundamental difference as to whether you're a buyer or a seller. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's, uh, that's a one way that the business is kind of defined. So at Paramount, you're a bank. You know, you're one of the six major financing distribution organizations. So you have every talent, agent, script, filmmaker, you know, the, the incoming traffic is, you know, 250 calls a day and however many emails and, you know, there aren't enough eyeballs to read the screen. Does that stunt uh, creativity in a way to have that kind of deluge, that avalanche? Well, you're always fighting in that kind yeah. of, uh, you know, between proactive and reactive and there's a lot of time you try to carve out to try to think about what you want to do so you're not just reacting to the a deluge of material and uh, but it was you know it's a hard balance to strike so I, I would say Paramount you know I felt I was just thrown into a raging river and swum as fast as I could for five years to kind of keep your head above water and 
you know, learned a lot and, uh, you know, emerged with a lot of relationships that then stayed with me through, you know, the rest of my career, you know, forged those relationships with uh, colleagues and peers and writers and mm -hmm. filmmakers that, you know, I became an advocate for. And, and, and you brought them in when you were working then at Mirage. Well, I tried to, yeah. you know, the, I tried to identify the people that I, you know, really believed in their talent and, you know, supported. And then, you know, you immediately go to being a seller and you get like five phone calls a day and everything <laughs> is self-generated. Yeah. So, uh, but I liked that, you know, I liked having the space to try to uh, initiate and get my own projects going and not just be kind of servicing somebody else's I understand that. Uh, when material. you were working with Sidney Pollack, um, so he died in 2008, so yeah. he's been dead a while, but was there a film you did with him that is particularly memorable or that has a story attached that you would want to share? Well, he was uh, a father figure to me, a partner to me. Uh, certainly the luckiest thing that happened in my career was spending almost 13 years uh, you know, very close to him and, uh, you know, watching his process. He was just a unique person because he'd studied to be an actor before he became a director. Uh, he was very precocious. He was Sanford Meisner's right hand at the mm. Neighborhood Playhouse in the early 50s. I think he was 19 years old and he was one of his top teaching aides. Uh, and he had a kind of X-ray vision, Sidney. You know, he could read a script and just break it down on the most fundamental level. Mm. You know, he really understood human psychology and character and dramatization. He was the Can smartest guy. Can you give us guy. an example of that on <laughs> a film that you worked on with Well, him? every story for him was, you know, a real, uh, what would you say, kind of forged in fire. Uh, he would just kick the tires of every scene and every beat of every scene and every motivation to try to, you know, feel the strengths of, of its truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and he'd always look for the spine of a story and he'd talk about it and almost like a sculpture would talk about, you know, like building an armature, then mm -hmm. the weight of it and how to hang, you know, ideas off of that. And, uh, you know, Tootsie, you know, famously was about a, you know, a man who had to become a woman in order to learn how to become a better man. Yeah. You know, he wasn't interested in it as a story about acting or the, you know, he wanted to find that thematic spine. So it was all, and he was tough. You was know? that, was there, uh, a, was there any kind of a, a friction with Dustin Hoffman on that, who I would imagine was interested in the acting? Yeah, piece? there was famously friction. Really? They had cats and dog fights. Really? And, yeah, there's a lot of stories you'll find oh, out there. I didn't know that. I'm just In the world guessing. about that. But yeah. yeah, it was epic. It was epic. And, you know, it's one of the greatest comedies ever made. Yeah. And, you know, I think often, you know, movies, you know, come out of the fire of that kind of. Uh, creative conflict, you know, they're, they're, they're often made in conflict and sometimes the ones that are serene and easy and everybody gets along and the dailies are great and everybody's smiling somehow lack that certain something, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, I always felt if people had too much freedom and uh, kind of a blank check to do whatever they want, often the They movies, need some resistance. Yeah. So you went from Mirage to, I guess, after Sidney Pollack's death to Sidney Kimmel Entertainment. Yeah, um, I decided to only work for a Jewish men named Sidney. That <laughs> I guess like I see that. kind of career strategy. A and Sid Gannis was my boss oh when my I was at, at Paramount. <laughs> so I had the three Sids. Did you, so what was the most memorable film you made uh, with Sidney Kimmel Productions, in your view? Well, you know, your movies are all your children, so it's a bit I know. Sophie's a choice to kind of... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, or the well, most, most memorable and challenging was the same, which is The Kite Runner. You okay. know, that was just a epically hard movie to get made on every level from uh, the development of it to the financing of it to the physical production of it to the post-production of it, the kind of storm that erupted around the... Uh, release of it, uh, issues with, you know, going into the third world and touching on the lives of the children who came to act in the movie and the, the politics of it. Uh, it was, uh, 
an incredible experience, you know, kind of no regrets. Uh, yeah, uh, did a lot of that fall to you? I mean, I guess I'm getting now to something that I wanted to ask earlier, which is what is a producer exactly? Because when you look at credits now, uh, there are so many producers, and especially on television, which you have also worked on, you see co-producers, supervising producers, consulting producers, executive producers, and there could be as many as yeah. 15. What does that mean? And what well, did you do? Well, it means it's the one job that nobody knows what, <laughs> what it is. You know, when you're a writer, you get yeah. the writer credit. When you're the director, you get the directing credit. Producing, unfortunately, uh, it became a, a form of compensation yeah. more than a job description. So people in a negotiation will seek out and be given the producer credit as part of the package of fees and other things. But they, they get. don't necessarily do and it, anything. It's not tied to a set of you know clearly defined uh, responsibilities. How do so, you know when you look at the credits who actually is the producer? Well, the Producers Guild has spent the last 10 or 12 years developing a system and finally developing the producer's mark now. So when you see a film now, if it says PGA after the producer's name, that means they've been vetted by an industry organization who looks at the all functions that producers provide from initiating a project to development through production, post-production, marketing, I see. distribution, and they say who had the most majority of responsibility over these areas of the filmmaking process. And that person is that's then PGA accorded after. that mark. But that didn't exist. That's been something that's been hard fought and I, created I to try to exactly try to claw back and, and answer this thing. You know, the people who do the work and have the final financial and creative authority and responsibility for the work should be distinguishable from people who might be the manager of a piece of talent or wrote a check or a to, star who or needs a star to get the, or yeah. his own company when you, uh, and when, you know it takes a village to make a movie I understand Paula. so <laughs> and know, a lot of egos too right? yeah but yeah. there's a legitimacy now more than ever you know uh, the studios are making fewer and fewer fewer films and to raise money independently you often have to go to multiple parties and you know they want credit and they deserve credit mm -hmm. it's just what's the appropriate credit and how do you distinguish the roles that different producers play. The other thing that you did that's off the beaten track or that you do is cartooning. And I mean you are a musician as well, but the cartooning which I saw originally on your website, that is, I mean it's so charming and I wonder where that desire came from. Have you always been somebody who Sketched. You know, I think I'm a little bit of a dilettante, if uh, yes. I had to be honest with you. you a know. renaissance man. <laughs> well, yeah, I play yeah. music, but I'm not, you know, uh, mm. Hubert Laws. I draw, but I'm not Art you write, Spiegelman. But you don't I write, but I really didn't <laughs> pursue, like, <laughs> Philip Roth. So you're a you know? producer. That's so it. <laughs> I put it all together, and yeah. I said, you know, this is a creative role that I can play. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, at its best... Uh, that's what it's very fulfilling you know you feel like you're uh, partnered with the writer and the director in a storytelling endeavor and you're kind of trying to protect the intentions of the screenplay and uh, you know make the most playable interesting exciting version of mm -hmm. any story for an audience and so uh, that's why edit editing is the most interesting part to me because it's like writing with film and the kind of final manipulation of sure. story crafting and, it and yeah. the combination of music i love composers when they come in and working with the score yeah. and the sound uh, so yeah i guess it, it touches on a number of the arts in one uh, discipline and i think because i you know didn't have the chutzpah to just pick one art and kind of <laughs> say i'm an artist in that genre this allowed me to do it all well it is really charming what uh, advice would you give an aspiring filmmaker? We have a film school program here at Drexel. I know it's one of the hottest majors. Students want to go into filmmaking yeah. and are often disappointed because it is a struggle and it's difficult. Um, do you have any advice uh, for well, how to pursue that career? Well, I would say many things. You know, read everything, see everything. You know, uh, I had to read about a thousand screenplays 
before I ever got a job because I, that was my job. I was a reader mm -hmm. before I got the gig at Paramount and, uh, you know, do what they called coverage and analyze the story. But it was a great uh, tool to try mm -hmm. to uh, both understand story structure on a, on a deeper level and also try to understand myself and my own taste. Uh, and that's the other thing I'd say, you know, just it's your voice. You got to be sincere, you know, and you got to have a passion for it. You got to know you're going to get rejected. You got to have perseverance uh, and just try to develop your own uh, point of view and your own individual voice and, you know, find uh, how to express that voice in whatever form that takes, you know, uh, through editing, through acting, through writing, through... Uh, you know, we live in a digital era, so the ability to create, the cost of that is almost zero today. Uh, and the barriers are almost zero. You know, anybody mm -hmm. can have their own YouTube channel and can create content and put it out there. And, you know, what's going to get eyeballs is, you know, having ideas, having a point of view, having a voice and trying to develop that and uh, okay. be yourself. Well, I think that's good advice, <laughs> although it still remains hugely competitive. Very. Well, I want to thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Paula. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel interview.